Hello and welcome to lecture number seven. I want to actually start today with a little story. The year is 1943. The Second World War is well underway, ravaging large parts of Europe. Military aircraft that has first entered the stage in World War I are now reaching their peak importance as they rain fire from the skies. But the Allied forces are facing a problem. As warplanes do get better, so do anti-aircraft systems. And in an effort to improve the survival of their fleet, the US military starts examining the planes returning from the skirmishes with the opposing forces. They characterize the pattern of bullet holes in the metal hull, meticulously noting down each hit that the plane sustained. The resulting picture is better summarized in the modern redrawn version in figure 1. After taking a look at the data they gathered, the military is ready to rush into action. To improve the endurance of the aircraft, the plan is to reinforce the parts of the plane that were most often hit by bullets. With stronger wings and a sturdier body of the plane, they think surely more pilots will come back from their missions safely. They were wrong. But this is where the story of Abraham Wald comes in. The pilots were in luck. The military consulted with the statistics research group at Columbia University. A man named Abraham Wald worked there. In his now unclassified report, a method of estimating plane vulnerability based on damage of survivors, he argued against the generals. Instead of the most hit parts of the planes, the least hit parts are to re are to be reinforced. The reason for this seemingly counterintuitive result is what is now known as survivorship bias. The data that was collected contained only survivors, those planes that sustained damage not severe enough to hinder them from coming back after their mission. The aircraft that were hit in other places simply didn't make it back. Consequently, Volt advised to reinforce the engines and the fuel tank. Let's think this a bit further. This is but one of a multitude of biases, specifically a selection bias, that will influence the quality of the inferences you can draw from the available data. Keep in mind, data is not objective and it never exists in a vacuum. There is always context to consider. The way the data is collected is just one of them. A lot of these ideas seem obvious in hindsight, which incidentally is another bias that social psychologists call hindsight bias, but they can sometimes be very hard to spot. A common saying is that music was better back in the days, or that all the old music still holds up, while the new stuff on the radio just sounds the same. Well, not quite. This is survivorship bias at work. All the bad and forgettable songs from the past just faded into oblivion, never to be mentioned again, while the songs people generally agreed to be good survived the ravages of time unscathed. A similar thing happens with success in general, not just songs. If you ask any CEO high up the corporate ladder, or a millionaire, or the author of a book that reads How to Get Rich, they are sure to have a witty anecdote about how their persistence or their brilliance or their charisma got them to where they are now. What they are not seeing is all the people just as witty, just as charismatic, or even just as persistent, that were simply not as lucky. Very few people will tell you this, because it takes a whole lot of courage to admit that one's success is based on luck and privilege. And to take it back to the scientific context, when you are planning an experiment for the lab, Always ask whether the data collection process can in some way be biased towards what you are actually trying to show. I want to leave you with this for this little introduction, which is a, a common inside joke among statisticians on Twitter. So from this cautionary tale, let's jump back into our studio. And here we are back in our studio. You might already notice that there is next to my usually li usual library tidyverse also a library clue because this is a package i just briefly wanted to show you as a little side note so let's jump down here to where it will end up in the script the side note about the clue package <laughs> 
And the reason this is here is because sometimes we want to construct some text or some labels, or we want to combine variables with some text. Uh, for example, um, we might have a name and we might have an age, for example, and now how old am I? Um, and then we might want to construct some text that says we are pasting together the text name and then some more text is and then the age and then some more text uh, and now we look at this text and we got a complete sentence if I add the full stop here. Now this paste function can sometimes be a bit cumbersome. It's nice to just combine variables with text, but if we want to do some more formatting, it can be a bit cumbersome. And this is where the clue package comes in. So you load it with library clue, and then you get access to the clue function. And the clue function, let me open up the help page on the side as well. And the clue function is very handy because we can give it just some text, a string, um, a character vector. And we have these special syntax of using curly braces to insert R code that will be evaluated into this into the text. So we can just say name is age years old. And this will leave us with the, uh, the same result. So notice if we have these curly braces here, Anything in there will be evaluated as R code, which means we can not only have variables here, we can also do stuff with those variables right inside of our text template. And you might want to take this whole text and insert it right into your document in the R markdown output. However, if I do, if I do it like this, then we will of course um, get this formatted specially as output. But if we want to insert this in line right into our text, just like we would have as normal text, then what we can do is let's say we save this to a variable. We can use inline R code. So when we use backticks, we can make sure things are formatted as code in the output. If I knit this, it will end up, let me actually just do this right now. Also means I can get a sip of coffee in between. Now, if I knit this, things will be formatted as code. So they use a different font. Sometimes they have syntax highlighting. Um, if we add the little R symbol here, so backtick R and then we and with a backtick, it will be actually evaluated as R code. So this here would fail because there's no such, such thing as just code in R. It's not, not a function, it's not a variable we have defined. So we could, yeah, we get an error here. But if we put something else in here, like one plus one, let's say we say one, one plus one equals and then the evaluated version of it. And we render this. What we end up with is the literal two in here. So we literally evaluated this and put the two here right into our code. So you can use this if you have, if you have some, say you want to write a report that is depending on some changing data and you need to write this report every week or something like this. Um, it's probably more common in a business context than in, in research. Usually, of course, we do new stuff every week, but if we're doing the same thing every week and just some numbers that change depending on your input data, you could easily write a report where the results will always update. So instead of calculating things in here, I could, of course, also put... Oh, let me leave this here. Um, I could, of course, also rely on some variables that I have defined earlier on. And this will then end up just in our, our markdown output.
So two things I showed you today as a little side note, the glue package as well as inline R code. And yeah, it just ends up in here. Uh, next up, I want to talk a little bit more about best practices when it comes to handling your data. And the main takeaway I want to give you is that your raw data is sacred. Do not ever modify it or save over it. So by raw data, I mean whatever comes out of, say, a measuring device you have, a machine, um, or if you wrote something down, you made some, some notes. This is also I consider raw data. When you, you noted down all the values in some table, some Excel table, for example. Um, if you want to have your raw data, don't modify it, don't change over it, it is sacred. And this also means that when you look at your raw data, and people often open this by default with something like Microsoft Excel, um, don't hit the save button in Excel when you're looking at your raw data. If you plan on doing some analysis in Excel, um, make a copy of your data first, um, so you don't accidentally modify your raw data. And this can happen very easily especially if with uh, genetics data, for example. Um, because Excel is very, it tries to be very helpful and it's often used in a business context. And in a business context, people care about dates a lot. So when did something happen? But the problem is there are some genes like Zeptin2, for example, which Excel will automatically convert into the date September the 2nd. And this is because last time I checked, it's, like two, two years ago, there was a paper that estimated um, or found out that one in five genetics papers actually had data errors because Excel converted those gene names into dates. Now, since then, biologists have sort of given up and renamed some of the genes that are commonly converted into dates instead of changing Excel or trying to convince more bio biologists to do some other means of analysis. Um, but the point still stands, um, never touch your raw data. And this also means if you are loading it in with R and then you're making some modifications to it and you're saving it, save it to a new place. A common way to do this is when you have a data folder, for example, where am I? Here in my data folder for lecture seven. Um, I'm not doing this for this course because we are not reading in data and saving clean versions of it. We're doing it all in one script. But usually when I have a project, I have one data for, for raw data, where all my raw data goes in. And then I have one folder for derived data, where the data got processed by some R script and then saved to the derived folder. So this way you can be sure that you can always recreate whatever you have in your derived folder if you have your raw data and your scripts. All right. Now, next up, we are getting more into statistics again. We are talking about covariance, correlation, and regression. And I want to start out with this lovely XKCD comic. Uh, I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class, and now I don't. When the other person says, sounds like the class helped. Well, maybe. And last uh, week, I believe, should be last week, we talked about the variance. And we want to use this as a way to get to covariance and then ultimately correlation. So um, the names are not only common, they are very, very related. The variance, um, if we look at the example plot I have here, these are just some normally distributed values. They will look different every time I run this code. Um, so we have an X and a Y which are just normally distributed. So every point has an X and a Y value. And if we are talking about the variance of a feature, in this case, X, for example, we would take all the distances of each data point to the mean, and the mean is highlighted here with the midnight blue lines. And then we get this expected value of this. So we're dividing by N minus one, and then we end up with the variance. Now, when we have a variance, what is now this covariance? 
the core variance, I have the formula down here. Um, and this might be a bit confusing at first, but it will become clear very soon. The core variance is the expected value of, and now we have two more expected values. And in this case, expected values is nothing more than a fancy way of saying the mean. So we have the mean of the random variable x and the mean of the random variable y. So for each data point, we have an x and a y. So we have the means. And then we have the distance of each point towards the mean. So this is very closely related to what we have in the variance. Um, so what the covariance is, is the expected value of the distances of x towards its mean times the distances of y towards its mean. Now, what does this mean in, in our example? Let's look at a couple of points. Um, this point up here, for example, is very much on the right side of x. So it has a positive x. It also has a positive y. And this means we are multiplying two, so it's, it's higher than its mean, than the mean of x. It's higher than the mean of y in the y direction. So we are multiplying two positive numbers together. We are getting a large positive number. On the other hand, this point down here, um, it has very negative, it's to the left of the mean of x, it's lower than the mean of y, so it's negative as the well. And now we are multiplying two large negative numbers, which means we are getting a large positive number as well. So these two points, they have an overall positive contribution towards the covariance. The other two quadrants, if we look at those, they will have a negative contribution because we are multiplying a negative contribution here, a negative contribution on the y, on the y value, with a positive contribution on the x value. So these will end up negatively contributing. And because we are taking the mean of all those things, if we have mainly positive contributions, we get a large positive covariance. If we have mainly negative contributions, so this would be a downwards going line, we get a large negative uh, covariance. If things are all over the place, just like in this case, um, these terms cancel each other out mostly, and we will get a covariance that is closer to zero. Now there's one problem with the covariance, and this is it's dependent on the scaling of our data, on the dimensions of our data, because we're dealing with the distances of each data point to its mean. And what we can do is standardize the covariance by dividing it by the pooled standard deviation. So in this formula, the standard deviation has the Greek symbol sigma. So we are multiplying each standard deviations um, and then we are using this to standardize the covariance and this is how we end up with the co correlation. Um, its full name would be Pearson product moment correlation coefficient or just correlation coefficient or even just Pearson's R. I should probably make this a capital P. We don't want to offend the guy. Um, if we square it, we get the R squared value, which we have seen before, and we will see again. Now let's look at a little data set to further practice our correlation understanding. So just uh, built into R and the, I think it's, it's from the tidyverse package, there is a Star Wars dataset. If we open up the help page for this, um, it comes from the dplyr package, so it comes from, from the tidyverse. And there we have 47 characters from the Star Wars universe, and for each we have a height, mass, hair color, skin color. Well, not for each. Some For some we don't have a hair color, which makes sense. The 3 po it's, it's a droid, so he doesn't have hair. He or it um, seems to be sort of male, but I don't know. I mean, it's a droid. Um, and then we have eye color, birth year, gender. Well, yes, apparently CP2K is gendered as masculine. Um, and then we have the home world, the species they belong to. We have the films they start in and 
Now, this is interesting. These are list columns now, films, vehicles, and starships, because Every character can, of course, have been in multiple films and can have driven multiple vehicles or starships. Um, but because I assume they didn't want to make this table really, really long and have the names duplicated, they put it in a list column. Um, however, right now we're not dealing with fancy list columns for now. I just want to look at height and mass because that's a very popular thing to look at for correlations. But the first thing I always do is create a plot. So we are plotting height versus mass. And let's add a geom point. Oh, actually, this will sort of be a spoiler. So let's not do this right now. Before we do this, let's look at some correlations first. Um, and for this, and for this, we need the uh, the function core. There's core for correlation. There's also cov for covariance. Um, but correlation is almost always more useful for our context. And let me also open up the help page with F1 on the side here. So what we are passing here is an X and a Y. So two vectors that we want to correlate. And I want to correlate the height. And I want to correlate the mass. Now this will throw an error, or not an error, it will just return an A, and this is because some characters don't have a height or a mass. I'm assuming this is some incomplete data, um, because, well, everything should have a height or a mass. But what we can do to fix this is in the use function we can say an option character string given a method for computing covariances in the presence of missing values. This must be um, everything, all ops, complete ops. So we want complete ops, which stands for complete observations. So it must, we'll just ignore everything where one of those things is an A, and then we should be fine, and we get a correlation of 0 0.13. Now, when I first did this, um, I was a bit surprised that this value is so low because, well, we would assume that height and mass are pretty much correlated. Like, bigger people tend to be heavier. Um, and 0 0.13 is pretty close to zero. Um, and let's find out why this is. If I now do the plot, um, and Think like this looks nicer. If we now do the plot, we see, well, this looks pretty much correlated, right? Higher mass meets higher height and the other way around. But there's this massive outlier, and I mean massive in the literal sense. Something here is really massive. And let me just insert a little time lapse, time lapse where I make this plot a bit clearer to show you what's the outlier here. Right, there we have it. Now, this is Jabba the Hutt. Um, if you have seen the movies, you remember the big, um, I don't know, guy that looks like a slug who has some beef with Han Solo, I believe. And, well, yeah, he's really, really massive, um, which means our Pearson correlation doesn't really work because we have this massive outlier. Now, what we could do, of course, is decide to remove this outlier if we have a valid reason. Um, a, a good approach here would also be some other way of measuring correlation. And what we have done so far is use the Pearson correlation. Now there's another guy um, who has the last name Spearman. And yeah, Pearson versus Spearman is not a boxing match. And we can use Spearman's correlation as well. So let me just take this whole thing and copy it. Because yeah, I'm lazy. Copy and pasting is always an option. So now let's call it, whoops. Let's call it Spearman correlation, not whoops. And now instead of 
not specifying the method here, we will specify the method spearman. And now suddenly we get a much higher correlation. Now why is this? You look at the method here. Spearman and candle. Um, actually, I hear this. But let me just explain in my own words. Um, Spearman uses a so-called rank correlation. So it's very, very similar to what we had earlier in uh, last week, where we talked about the difference between a t-test and the Wilcoxon rank sum test. So the Spearman correlation converts everything to ranks first, and then we are getting the correlation. I actually have a plot prepared for this, but once again, I'm copy and pasting because how we're making this plot is not as important as the content of this plot. And I'm not saying this often because I usually I really like making plots, um, but I try to, to focus on the statistic this time. So this is the rank transformation of this. And now the outlier will, would be one of these points, uh, would be Jabba again. Um, but he doesn't have a massive influence <clears throat> because it's just the next point in the line. We can get more information um, about a correlation with the function core.test. So up here, we use the function core, but we also have core.test. And well, we get a warning because we have ties <coughs> as a result of our ranking. Um, but we get to get some more information about our correlation. We get what was correlated. We get the p-value for this correlation, <coughs> the alternative hypothesis, and the sample estimates for this raw value. Same if we were using Pearson. Let me actually leave it at Pearson here. Oh, let's leave it like this. So in the script, you will see that those options are, of course, available. Another uh, way of looking at our correlation test result is with the broom package and the tidy function from this. Actually, I think we will be using the broom package uh, a bit more today. So let's put this up here library room and now we can use the prune functions all out of our script <clears throat> now sometimes we want not just the correlation for two vectors we want the correlation for a bunch of things and then we end up with a so-called correlation matrix so um, in the star wars data set unfortunately there's not as many numbers to correlate. There's height and mass. And there's birth here, which I guess we could interpret as a number. Um, but if we go selecting all numeric columns, well, it's only three. So it's not much fun making a correlation matrix with just three, uh, three, three features. So uh, let me quickly look at another example data set. Oh, and let's throw in a hat here so that in the script we are only displaying the first couple of rows. Now the data set I want to briefly look at is the empty cars data set, which is also included in R by default in the data sets package that's loaded by default. And we have the it's, it's observations for a bunch of cars with the miles per gallon they can drive, the number of cylinders, the displacement of the cylinder, um, the horsepower of the car. I, I have no idea about cars, to be honest. Um, I just use this because it's in, in R by default and we have a bunch of numbers in here. So let's plot, for example, um, I usually plot, for example, the displacement versus the, let's go miles per gallon, 
No, it's not ASE, it's AES. All right, so it looks like miles per gallon have, should have a should have a large negative correlation, which means the higher the displacement, the lower the miles per gallon. Now, what about the other values? We want this correlation value for all combinations of features that we can think of. And for this, we can use the core function again. And in core, we just give it a data set. Now, this only works if all columns of the data set are actually numeric, and this works here. So if we had some other columns, we would have to filter or select those first. Um, and this column here is actually not a, a column, it's the row names, which might be confusing because, um, well, regular data frames, they don't have, um, well, regular data frames can have row names, but tables can't. In tables, this would be an extra column, uh, which we would have to filter out first. And now we get this correlation matrix if we run core here, um, which means for every combination of features, we get the correlation. For example, um, each feature with itself should have a correlation of one because it's perfectly correlated, it's the same thing. <coughs> um, but for example, um, the number of cylinders and the miles per gallon have a large negative correlation. So more cylinders means less miles per gallon in this data set. This is not a general statement about cars. I'm not an expert on cars. Um, but surely there is a nicer way of displaying this. And yes, indeed there is. So let me first take this whole thing and convert it to a tibble. Now you notice in doing so we lose the row names, but we can tell it to convert the row names into a new column. Let's call it feature. And all these other features, I then want to make longer. Everything but the feature column. And this is to make sure we are ending up with our tidy data format. And now we can use ggplot here. On the x-axis, I want the feature. On the y-axis, I want the name, which is actually just the feature again. Um, and then we want to fill something by value. So we are using geom raster here. Geom raster is a version of um, geom rect and geom tile, except geom raster is a bit faster when all the tiles, the rectangles, have the same size. And now this is the heat map we end up with, where the darker the color, the higher the, no, the, in this case, the more negative the correlation, which means we should definitely use a different color uh, scheme here. Um, scale fill, is there something like diverging? I think it should be gradient. Yeah, gradient. And now we can specify the low point. Well, let's make it blue. We can specify the high point. Well, let's make it red. And the, oh, there's no midpoint here. So I think it must be scaled gradient two, which also has the midpoint. And now we need to tell it where the midpoint is. It should be at zero. And now we have this diverging color scheme. So we can exactly see which way the correlation goes. Now there should of course be better, um, better colors for this, but for the sake of brevity, let's leave it at this. Let's just format it a bit more nicely. And what we could also do is add some, oh, I actually like to add geoms before we are doing any scaling and stuff. So geom, let's add some text where the label is a rounded version of the value. Uh, let's round to two decimal places. Oh, this is looking quite nice. Now this is a correlation matrix 
we visualized. Um, you notice we had to go through a couple of steps to, to achieve this. We had to convert it to a tibble. We had to, to, to pivot longer it, and then we had to make the plot. If we, you are doing a lot of correlation matrices and lots of correlation, I should point you to the core package. So let's pull this up here. Core is part of tidy models, but I don't think it's automatically loaded. So let's do this just off the off the book basically. Core we can load. Actually, uh, let me just use some functions from it. So it's more explicit where there's core functions. Um, the first function, the main function is correlate, where we are giving it a data set. And then we are getting, instead of this matrix that we had earlier, we are getting already a tidy table, which has an additional attribute that it is a correlation data frame. So we have the term here, which we called feature earlier on. And then we got all these features. Now we could do our regular pivot longer now. Uh, core already comes with a function for this called stretch. And this converts it into a form that will be nicer to plot. We got x, y, and r. R is our value from earlier on. And now we could either use our same ggplot code up here or from the core package use the r plot function um, and apparently r plot doesn't even need the stretching it does this already so let's pull close this one here and now look at our our correlation matrix except this time it's not using this square format we're just using dots here which can sometimes be very nice because the unimportant things sort of fade into the into the background because they're just white and the important things they get bigger and more colorful so for example we can focus that there's a large negative uh, correlation between miles per gallon and wt and i don't recall what wt is there is a, so we, we don't need core stretch here, apparently. Let me write this in a different way. So I don't forget to mention this in the script. Now we're getting the stretch version and we're also getting the unstretched version as a plot. Oh, I should stop my Pomodoro timer. There is another function to visualize this whole thing, which can also be very interesting. What kind of plot is it? It's a network plot. And there we get highlights of which variables are highly correlated to which other variables, which is uh, sometimes a very interesting way of exploring your data. So if you're working a lot with correlations, definitely check out the core package. All right, one thing that always crops up is that these correlations, especially when we look at like plots like these, plots like these, it looks very similar to what we had earlier with linear regressions. Now, what is the difference between a correlation and a linear regression? So this is the formula we are using when we are fitting a linear model. We got y, some response variable y, depending on our, our normal formula a plus x times b. So we got the offset or the intercept and the slope of our curve. Now, the main difference is that when we have a correlation, both of these variables x and y are random variables. So they have their own random variation. In a linear regression, x on the x-axis is not a random variable. This is something we have fixed. Um, this is something that is not subject to random change. This is something, um, for example, an experimental condition that we have set, um, or say we are setting a temperature, for example. Um, this is not something we have measured. 
Sometimes the distinction can be a bit hard, but it should be obvious in, in most cases. Uh, let's look at another a data set where linear regression is more appropriate than correlation. And for this, I downloaded some uh, ratings for Star Wars movies, actually, from the movie database. So take a look at the R script in the R folder if you want to know how I did this. So let's call it ratings. And it's in the R data set format. So in RDS format. Now it's just 10 rows, but we have a bunch of information about the Star Wars films. Oh, we even have a summary of the plot, that's nice. But importantly, we have the IMDB rating, which I want to be looking at. <clears throat> and we also have the year it was released. So let's make a plot here. And because I want to be adding some other things to this plot, let me maybe speed this up in the edit. So Okay, um, there's a couple of things I did here. Um, first, I fitted a linear model. So the data is going to is the ratings data, and we are fitting the IMDB rating. Um, as the response of the year predictor variable. So then we have our model and we're using the function augment from the broom package to take this model and give us the fitted value for the rating depending on the year um, according to the formula that the model fitted. Which means we can use these fitted values to plot this line here and to add these segments here. And I also added the confidence interval of the GM Smooth, from GM Smooth. Um, but I want to talk about um, how this linear model actually works. So what you're seeing here, these lines, we call these the height of these lines the residuals of the model. It's often a good idea to um, just look at the height of the residuals and plot those, which you can, which you can get from augment. In augment, you always uh, also get the resid function, uh, the resid column. But here we're just plotting these as segments. And what a linear model does, um, it is also called ordinary least squares. And the squares we're talking about is the square of each of these, well, residuals. So we are minimizing these squares around, if you take each line and square it, we are minimizing the area of all those squares. So we are moving the right line around until we have minimized the distance to all the points, which is why it's called ordinary least squares. Uh, note that on the year column, there is no error. On There's no random variation in the year. We, we know exactly when, when each, we know exactly when each um, film was released. But the rating is something that depends on lots of random influences. Of course, the quality of the of the film, but also there's a bunch of people voting on this, so there's lots of uh, uh, lots of opportunity to get some random variation in there. So x x x is a fixed. The ratings vary as a response in some way of the x axis, which is why we're using a linear model and not a correlation here. Um, Two more things about correlations and covariances that I want to stress, which is not true for linear models, at least not in all cases. Um, correlations are symmetrical, which means the correlation coefficient for x depending on y is the same as the correlation coefficient for y depending on x. Uh, correlations and covariances are also scale and translation invariant. Uh, well, um, the covariance uh, wouldn't be because uh, we're not standardizing, but the correlation is is definitely scale and translation invariant, which, which means if we scale by some value a and we, we are shift by, by some value b, 
And we are also shifting y by some value c and or we're shifting by some value d and multiplying by some value c, which is constant. And this does not change the correlation coefficient. The same is not true for linear models. Um, there are the parameters we get out, of course, depend on the scale. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't make, make sense for us to get this formula out. Finally, I want to briefly touch on the R2 value, which we get from uh, both correlations as well as linear models. And one way you can think of the R2 value is the fraction of the explained variance in the response variable that is explained by the predictor variable. So a high R squared means we can explain lots of the variation in the response variable by our predictor variable. Now, another question that might be under your fingers now is we have talked about very simple linear models and correlations. We haven't talked about non-linear models. What if you have some physical formula that you want to fit to your data and then get some values out? And for this, let's look at a very classical example, uh, Michaelis Menten kinetics, which should be familiar to the biochemists amongst you. Um, if not, just think of it some, uh, as some formula we want to fit to our data. Um, and the background is not really important in this case. Now, there's already a data set in base R that we can use for this, called pyromycin. So let's have a look at this data set. When we execute pyromycin, we get this data set from base R, and we have uh, 23 rows in total. First, we have a concentration. Then we have a rate that was measured and the state. And the state is either treated or untreated. There's apparently one row less for untreated because I assume there's some data point missing. So let's do what we always do when we get some, some new data set. Let's make a plot. Oh, and another thing that I want to do is right now this is a base R data frame. Um, I'd like to use uh, tibbles instead because if we compare how, how a base R data frame prints in the terminal, it just prints everything. Whereas if we convert it to a tibble, we get all these informations. Which is um, which is handy and also if you get a really large data frame, it doesn't completely cover all our output. All right, so let's do this now by just call a lowercase promotion using as table. And in here, it doesn't change anything because in our markdown, when we're looking at it in our studio, it is essentially printed just like a table. And now we're using this pyramise in here. And I want to plot on the x-axis the concentration. I want to plot the rate on the y-axis. And I want to color everything by state. And conveniently, state is already a factor. So let's go with geon point first. And now we see we have two data points for each of the concentrations, except for the last concentration where we have one less for the untreated. And the curve that would fit this has the functional form of rate is the maximum velocity, the maximum rate times the concentration divided by Km, or the, the michaelis menten constant, uh, plus the concentration. And what we want to find out when we're fitting a curve to this is exactly this Vmax and the Km value. Now, what we want to do now is, of course, add a line to this. Um, however, if we just add a geom line here, it will just connect all the points, straight lines, and this is not physically meaningful. We want to fit this function. Now, let us explore this function first um, by building it in R. So. We want to create a function that gives us the rate 
Um, this is a function of B max. It is a function of let's let's actually start with the concentration. It's easiest to start this function with whatever will be on the x-axis, and then the parameters follow. So parameters are Vm and k. And we get the result by Vm times concentration divided by and now we need this k plus concentration. And now we can plug in any concentration, any Vmax, and any k. Let's uh, go with this. And we get a rate out. Now let's add this function to our graph. So we have our points here. And now we're adding a geom function. Where are they fun? Is now unfortunately we can't just pass this rate function here because geom function always expects a function of x, which I guess we could have made our lives easier if we just called the first parameter x. But in this case, let me just create a lambda function here. Um, an anonymous, func anonymous function on the spot where we pass in to the rate function x as the concentration and then we have a vm which we need to set um, let's go we can estimate this here for example um, 200 would be the, around the vmax maybe probably higher um, and then hey for the michaelis men constant let's go with something like 0.3 and plot this. And right now we're not seeing anything. Let's check out why this is. We want to first give it a color. Because these global aesthetics also apply to all geoms. So let's make it a bit different color. And then we need to find out why it's not plotting. And the reason it's not plotting is that I'm constructing this lambda function here and the lambda function always creates um oh it even says so so here I should have should have read this warning uh, always creates a function where the first argument is called dot x not x dot x and now we're getting a function here and this is of course far off from all the data points because we just guessed some numbers and um, now what we want R to do is to take our function and play around with these numbers like we could do here for example i could increase these numbers change these around until we're getting closer to oh, we're getting better and so i could change change these around until i get closer to the data points now we need some way of knowing how far off the data points we are um, and in the function that we will be using called nonlinear least squares we will be minimizing the square distances of the function to the points. So let's do this now. So we will be creating a model. And I'm sure there should be more creative ways than just a model. Maybe something more telling, like Michael is meant model or something. Um, but for this, we need the function NLS. <clears throat> Let me also open up the help page with F1 on the side. And remember to do that as well if you, you're working with it, just to, to make sure you're getting all the parameters wrong, right, not wrong. Um, and the first thing we want is a formula. So as a formula, we want to fit the rate as a function, uh, um, or depending on our actual rate function. So this here rate will refer to the rate column in Puromycin. And this rate is the function we just wrote above. Now we want to fit it as a function of concentration and then there's a VM and a K. So I'm not giving any values to these just yet. I could make this more explicit, but because I know the order these things are in, I can just leave this out. <clears throat> 
And right now this wouldn't work because first we need to give some data to it. So that R knows where to look for these columns. So we got our formula, we got our data. Uh, next up, um, this will not work because um, it can't initialize VM and K. Oh, actually, it just did. Did it just work? All right, it just worked. Um, I was not expecting this. Um, and the reason I wasn't expecting this, um, maybe there's some, some update in the latest R version, um, which is uncommon because like those base R functions are rarely updated. But normally, you need to tell and ten tell NLS some starting values. Like it needs to know what VM and what K value it should start off. Just some crude guess that we can give it. Otherwise, and it just told us this, <clears throat> apparently, it just initializes all values to one. And sometimes um, this means that the function, like if you check this, how this looks like, will be, yeah, very different to our data. <laughs> so um, if it, if it yeah, set both to one, just a flat line. So maybe when this happens, what you can get is something called a singular gradient warning or error, because R doesn't know how to change the parameters because it looks the same in all directions. So this gradient is what, um, what R estimates to, to get you closer to the points. Um, now, in this case, apparently it worked, even though the line was initially very, very far off our data. Um, but let me make this a bit more explicit by saying start. And as start, we give it a list, and then the elements of the list will be starting values for our parameters. So let's set 200 and um, 0.3 as our starting values. And now it's happy. And yeah, I'm, I'm still shocked that it just worked earlier on, but this will be uh, safer for this case because we, we, we can already guess the maximum velocity a bit. We can already guess if we remember from biochemistry that the Km is the concentration at, at which we have the half maximum velocity. So for both of these, we should be around here. So we can give it some guesses. Um, we can later compare actually how this differs Right now it estimates 190 and 0 0.06. Um, what happened here if we did it without the... Yeah, it, it finds way different it's different values. So something completely ridiculous. Um, like, And it doesn't really get closer to a date. Actually, how does it get so close? Does it think like it's as such a high convergence. So this is the distance in the end to all the points. Let's actually check how this, how these values are here. It's like 17 something and minus, or oh, interesting, a negative K. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. So as you can see, this function does sort of fit our data, but it makes no physical sense. And uh, this is why we give it starting values. And then we find more reasonable values. Um, let's plug these in, 190. I'm doing this manually here just to show you what, what's happening, 0 0.06. Yes, and this is closer. Um, I should mention that specifically for Michaelis Menten or Michaelis Menten kinetics, there is something called a self-starting model, and this is SS McMen. So all these self-starting models they start with SS McMen, which we can use inside of NLS in in the formula here, and then we don't need to give it starting parameters; it's it's able to estimate those itself. Um, that's actually exactly the same example. That it's that we are just doing the pyromycin one. 
Mm. So you can read through this if you want to know how SS make man works. <clears throat> However, it is of course always more general if I teach you the general concept of just filling something instead of a specific self-starting model. If you can have, if you can fit any function and just uh, give, give it some starting values, you will of course be able to solve more problems. So um, let's explore this model a bit. Oh, and notice um, I'm just fitting one model for both states, which doesn't really make sense. We will we will deal with this later. <clears throat> Actually, the better thing to do right now for showing things would be to just let's look at just one state for now. And then we are oh, and I need a double equal sign here. And now we're only working with the treated, the treated values. So if I plot this down here, Um, this, of course, doesn't make much sense because these are just the values we got manually. So how do we get the values from our function or from our model for this? Let's explore the model a bit. And I want to use the room package again. And in order to be tidy, let's move this up to the top. Oh, and I already, already put it here. All right. So we are we now have all the functions from the broom package available. We can look at the tidy representation of our model, which tells us for each term the maximum velocity in k, the estimate, the error around this estimate, as well as some p-value in the statistic. Now those two first those first columns would be the most important ones. <clears throat> now, when we are plotting this, how can we now plot this model on our function? And for this, let me introduce the predict function, which is just from Beza, it's not from Vroom actually. Um, the predict function takes a model and gives us the predictions. Um, however, instead of the predictions, we can also give it some new data. So. Here is all the variance, so it depends on what model it gets, but predict.nls is what we, we are using. And there's this new data argument. It's a named list or data frame in which to look for vari variables with which to predict. So when we're just using it without new data, we get the original predictions. Um, so this would be the prediction for the first concentration, which would be this one here. But when we say new data is a list where the concentration is, let's say we want a number, um, a sequence from zero to how high does the concentration go? One. And we're going in steps of 0 0.1. Now let's go 0 0.2, um, 0 0.01. Now we are suddenly getting a whole lot of predictions, which means we can plot these. So in here, in instead of function, let me actually make this a function of where the new model, where the new data just comes from the x-axis. So new data, list, concentration, dot x 
So we are not explicitly creating the sequence of x values for which to predict the rate. We are just letting geom function do this. Now the alternative would have been to put this in a table and then get the predictions. But here geom function takes care of equally spacing out these values. And yes, this is the function that we fitted. Um, let me quickly show you how we could have done this manually. We could have, say we want to create a table. And in this table, we run the number of concentration, which is a sequence of numbers, equally spaced numbers. And then we get the rate by predicting from the model. And then as new data, we are passing this concentration in our table. So this is what our prediction data frame would look like. And then we could plot this. So instead of using geom function here, we can use geom line. where as the data we are giving it the predictions and let's make it back. okay same result so internally this is sort of what geom function does it creates equally spaced numbers on the x-axis and then feeds it through a function and if we can either, we can either do this by hand beforehand or just do it in geom function. If we don't care about the individual, like having a smooth line here, we just want the predictions at each point where we previously had a data point. We can use another function from Broom, and this is, I believe, I believe augment. So augment takes a model. And it gets out the original data, the concentration of the rate, but it also gives us the fitted value and the residuals. So the residuals is the distance from the data point to the fitted value. And this um, can then be used to plot them, for example, Always a good idea to plot the residuals as well. So we are plotting concentration versus the residuals. Hmm. But in this case, we don't have that many points. Usually, you would need uh, you would need this to check that your residuals are roughly normally distributed. Because this is one of the assumptions that uh, both linear models LM and NLS have. They work best when the residuals, whatever, so the, the remaining distances are normally distributed around our curve. Now, up until now, we have only fitted one model for the treated state. So let's go about fitting models for both states at the same time without having to copy and paste too much. So this is going to be one of those many models things. So let's start out with our data set. And then I'm going to group it by state. And then nest it. So what this does is it takes the data for each state and put it, puts it in a list column called data, which means we can now 
iterate over this data column. And we're doing this inside of mutate. And we are iterating with our familiar perf function map. So I want to create a model. And this model will be created by mapping over, no, not map live, by mapping over the over the data column. And now we need a function to fit to order to fit. So let's go up here. We have already done this before. There is our basically what, what we did here. We can just copy and paste. So let's put this down here. So we are taking as the data, the treated, and then we are fitting the model and returning this. So let's turn this into a function. Fit Migman. Um, and this is a function of some data. And in there, exactly this will happen. We will fit our model. Let me reformat this. Control I to indent. Um, we will fit our model, but now it will not be, de be dependent on the treated data. It will depend just on the data that we are passing to the function. And now we can use this function in here. And when we run this, we get another column here with our model. Let's also extract some parameters from our model. And for this, we use the broom function tidy. So we are mapping over the model column this time and we are using the function tidy. All right, we got our par parameters, but we can't see them unless we save it to a variable first. And now we could either look at this visually, which is quite nice, just control click it. And then we got the terms for our models. Or let's make a proper table out of this by, uh, let's look at it again, by taking our models uh, table and then unnesting. Actually, let's select just the state and the params, and then we unnest params. And then let's actually just select the state, the term, and the estimate for the term. And now what we can do is pivot, not longer, pivot wider. We want to pivot wider where the names come from the term column and the values come from the estimate column. And now we get a nice table with the fitted parameters for our models for both states. And we can compare those, print those out as a nice table. What we also, whoops, also want to do is make some predictions and plot these. So we want to plot these nice lines. And for this, let's look at our models again. We have multiple options. Um, let me show you one first. And the first one is we take the code we had up here, where we create some predictions. And this is now a familiar workflow. We find out how we did it for one case, and then we turn it into a function. So let's turn it into a function, um, make predictions. And this is a function of some model. And in there, we will generate some predictions. And in, I'm not saying those in, to a variable in the function, I'm just returning these. Let's control I to re-indent. So we are taking the model. So this model will be used in here and predict. We're generating some evenly spaced numbers. So now what we can do is take these models 
uh, and mutate. Let's call the new column we are creating threads for predictions. And now we can map over the model column. And what we're using is the function make predictions. This gives us a table of predictions, which we can't look into right now. So let's select just the state and the prints. And then unnest them, the Brits, the Brits, yes. All right, these are our predictions. And now we can use these predictions in a plot. So we are starting with the normal pyramising plot. So we are plotting concentration versus rate, color coded by state. And now we're adding a geom point. This is our normal plot. But what we're now also adding is a geom line with the specialty that this geom line has different data. It has the predictions as data. And there we go. If you want to make more or less predictions, we can change these values here. Say we wanted to predict until 1.5 and we would get more predictions out here. Of course, we don't want to predict too much outside of our data because well, it's going to be less accurate. Okay, um, another way of going about this, and I want to briefly show this, but it's a bit more confusing at first, um, but sometimes faster, is we take our normal ggplot. Let me actually just copy and paste this. And, oh, it's incomplete, right? And in ggplot, remember we have geom smooth. And geom smooth can fit a function to our data. It can, well, normally just create some squiggly smooth lines. We have used it before with the method lm. But linear model is, of course, not what we want. And what we want is this nls, non-linear least squares model. And this is also possible to be used in as the method here. So you can now use NLS, but this by itself shouldn't do anything, right? Because we haven't told NLS what it could actually calculate. So we need to give uh, our method some more information. So let's go up to where we fitted the model. Can do some more copy and pasting. So yeah, this is how our model normally looks like. All right, so what we also need in GeoSmooth is a formula now. And the formula will be the formula we are passing to NLS. However, um, in GeoSmooth, we always need a formula that is some y dependent on some x. So we need to swap out these two names. We need to swap out rate for y and we need to swap out the concentration for x. And this will still not work because, um, well, it, it might actually work. It will just do weird things. Um, no, it, it won't work because, um, well, our model needs some starting value unless we have a self-starting model. So how do we pass the starting, the starting values here? In GeoSmooth, there's something called method.args. And these are um, here, it's in the documentation down here, a list of additional arguments passed to the modeling function defined by method. So these, this list we are creating here will be passed as additional arguments to NLS. So in this list, we want to pass the additional argument start. And start is also a list, so we have a list in a list where we now pass our starting parameters. However, there is an additional problem and this is really, really hard to spot unless you you know that it exists by default geom smooth 
tries to plot a confidence interval. And this is easy for geom, um, uh, for, for the method being a linear model LM because a linear model returns a, 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 confidence, a confidence interval. But our model does not have a confidence interval. Um, there's no such thing as confit in here. And this is because why Geom Smoothies complains here. Computer, uh, and it's, it's a, like a really nonsensical complaint, actually. It's really hard to spot. So what we need to do here is SE equals false. And yeah, this is like, basically impossible to spot if we don't know this. So no confidence interval for method NLS, and then it works. Right, so the GM smooth is a nice way of adding fitted lines to our plot. However, we don't get the actual values and parameters out, and this is why we had to fit the function man manually beforehand and make our own and make our own models. Now there's one more thing I wanted to mention because this approach of taking a data set and then nesting it and then using mute mute in a map function, this will always work. But when we previously talked about many models, I showed you a different approach, which unfortunately does not work in this case. And this is why I especially want to show it, um, because it does something weird that you're not expecting. So, I previously did something similar to saying, we take our data set, and we group by some state, um, and then we use summarize. And in summarize, we just define our model right away the same way we would do it here. And we're not passing the data argument because, and this is what I explained, um, because the data argument tells NLS where to look for these columns, rate and concentration. So if we're not giving it these, this data argument, it just looks around its environment to see where it finds these variables. And because everything is in inside of summarize and or any other deep layer variable, it knows about these, these columns, right? So this part, if we wrap this in a list, this part will work. Um, we are getting some models here. Now the problem arises if we save this now to a variable, variable and attempt to use it later on. So in here, when we made the predictions, we created this function that takes a model and makes our predictions and we used it in here. So if we use one of these new models, this will actually not work. And we get a really weird error. Let me just show you uh, new models. Let's just pass the first model here. We get like a really weird error. Um, too late to resolve rate at the end of deep layer summarize. Did you save an object that uses rate lazily in a column in the deep layer summarize expression? Now, this will be really confusing because this is because of something we did um, much earlier on. This is uh, refers to up here. And if you're doing this later, of course, you, you don't remember what you did a couple of minutes ago or maybe half an hour. Um, so it's really hard to debug this sort of thing. Uh, let me explain what's happening here so that you don't run into the same issue. Um, and just to reiterate, this approach with grouping and nesting, it always just works. Um, but this approach where we're not explicitly using a map function will not work. And the reason for this um, is that inside of Summarize, um, we have access to uh, our column. This, this is true. But um, NLS does not remember um, the actual values of the right column and so forth. Um, it only remembers where it got the data from and then that it has to use the right column. But what NLS remembers is, oh, I got the data from Summarize. Um, and it doesn't actually keep the data. It just keeps uh, a note saying, 
all right, I got my data from around myself. Um, it is here and we look at just the model. It says parent.frame. So from the frame around me. But this parent frame has now changed. Inside of make predictions, we are no longer inside of this summarize. So NLS, which we are using in here in the, the model to predict something, does not know where to look for the data. Um, so NLS will be confused and throw this very confusing error. So it's always safer in this case um, to just do the explicit grouping and then nesting so we can pass our data explicitly to our fitting function. Let me let me put this somewhere so I can explain it. And the reason we didn't stumble across this when we fitted the linear models using this um, shorter approach, sort of, uh, was because we didn't didn't use the model afterwards. We just looked at the predictions, or we just looked at the parameters. All right. So after this confusing error, the rest should just work. And this is all I have for you today. And I look forward to what you're doing in the exercises, and I'll see you in the seminar.